Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. We are so happy to welcome Dr. Kathleen Janelle to this event. Kath, Dr. Janelle is a graduate of Bastyr University and has been practicing digestive medicine for over 25 years. And over the past decade, she has actually developed and refined a unique treatment approach for digestive disorders. And she has used this therapy for patients and around the country and around the world to help eliminate symptoms of abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, gas and bloating due to IBD and also SIBO. Dr. Janelle's specialty natural medicine has been a friend to Evolving Nutrition and Nutri Northwest since the beginning, and we are so thankful that she'll be presenting today and on our behalf about GI Janelle and the treatment of digestive issues. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Janelle so that she can present a case study that she has in regards to treating and utilizing GI Janelle with one of her patients. Okay, thanks, Amanda. So I'm going to read a case study from the book that I published in 2019, and this book is actually full of case studies um, of resolution of IBS and SIBO, gas and bloating uh, symptoms. So this particular one is a 21-year-old woman who came in with the symptoms of gas and bloating pain all day long, every day. In addition to that, she would have episodes of diarrhea that would last for three days long and were so severe, she would typically end up in the ER or urgent care and need to receive IV fluids for dehydration. Um, by the time she got to me, she has also seen several other um, naturopaths and functional doctors, so she brought some testing in with her that we could use. She'd also seen a gastroenterologist and had all of the scopes and scans and they could find no reasons for her digestive issues there. So the first thing I did was I simplified her diet because she came in with a list of about 20 foods that were on her test that she had taken out of her diet. She did say um, that her symptoms didn't change much with the change in diet, but she did have less reflux symptoms with that initial change in diet. So she had these 20 foods out. What I did was I simplified it and took out only dairy, wheat, sugar, and whole eggs, because that's the group that actually causes inflammation in the digestive system, and pretty much everything else on that panel is gonna be secondary to that. So we wanna focus on that and make her life easier. So we added in a bunch of foods that she had been avoiding. The second thing that I did was I simplified her supplements because along the way, um, with her trying to get answers, she would, had been put on about 15, 20 supplements in total and was taking all these, but wasn't really getting a change in symptoms. So basically I said, you can continue those if you want to, but consider it your choice at this point, And we're just gonna focus on getting your digestion better. So maybe you can actually absorb some of these um, even better in the long run. So I put her on GI Janelle Digest A to help initiate digestion and act as a mild antimicrobial. And I put her on GI one powder at an initial starting dose, which is half teaspoon. That's what's on the label. Um, and I let her go for four weeks. She came back in four weeks and told me that her diarrhea had improved. It was less severe and less frequent. Her gas and bloating was about the same, maybe even a little worse. And this I told her was a really good sign. If the loading dose of GI Janelle 1 causes a little more gas and it's passing and a little more bloating, then that means we're getting a shift in the microbiome, fermentation species, and eventually we're gonna have a really good result. So I encouraged her to continue doing her gradual increase and had her go away for another four weeks and get to the full treatment dose of six teaspoons a day. When she came back four weeks later, um, at her checkup, she said that when she got to half the full treatment dose, which is three table or three teaspoons a day, um, her gas and bloating resolved and they never came back. Her diarrhea and her constipation alternation improved and she was now having regular daily stools. So the only other thing we did was I did some uh, food desensitization on her to see if we can bring foods back in now that her system was strong and she wasn't having symptoms. And we were able to add back in sugar, whole eggs, and cow dairy, um, and a limited amount of wheat. So she got to eat 
um, wheat in terms of pastries, she was fine, pies, cakes, cookies. Um, she didn't tolerate pure wheat bread, so she just kept that of her diet. But otherwise, I've been following her now for about seven years, and her symptoms have never returned. That's wonderful. So ha what, what deficiencies did the GI Janelle one repair, do you think? Well, that's what we're gonna look at in these slides. So actually, let me go back a sec. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, so essentially what we're gonna focus on in this webinar is sulfur, sulfur deficiency, the concept of sulfur. Um, sulfur is the third most common mineral in your body. Uh, it's third only to calcium and magnesium, and it's about equal to phosphate. So it's essential. It's essential for life. You can't live without sulfur. And what sulfur does, it's a structural, has you know structural and functional properties, but as a structural property, it creates tissues that are strong and flexible. So we're talking about digestive system, we're talking about mucus, the mucus protective layer on the digestive system, skin, hair, and nails, all of those tissues that we want to be able to bend and move and have elastic recoil, but also have strength. Um, in terms of how they operate. Sulfur is involved in that. Sulfur is also necessary to fix and build DNA and to protect any damage um, that can be caused to the DNA and lead, lead, um, lead to serious diseases. So just to summarize, sulfur is a, fun, uh, a structural repair protein, so it can help repair leaky gut, the digestive barrier, the mucus protection in the gut, but it's also a functional treatment because it also works as an antibiotic and an antifungal to get rid of the food that's fermenting in your system, the fermentable foods fermented by the bacteria and the yeast. So let's look at repair first. Sulfur is like a glue. Put simplistically, you can see that I represented it here with S linked to S. That's the glue part of it. And how that looks chemically is it's two amino acids. They're both cysteine and they're bound through this sulfhydryl area. This is a reduction reaction where you lose the hydrogens. Boop, off they go. And what you're left with is the ability of the S binding to the S. That's the sulfur. You link a bunch of these together and you get tissue. The more concentration of these sulfur bonds in the tissue, the more rigid it is. So we can go through some of those tissues. Um, and I'm going to do, again, sulfur bound to sulfur, sulfur linked to sulfur, represented with that elemental symbol for sulfur, uh, which is S. So let's look at the digestive tract. Digestive tract is, it's kind of squishy, but it still has solid structure, right? So it's not gonna change necessarily the places where it has different shapes, but it's gonna be able to stretch and recoil. It's gonna be able to move and have things move through it, kind of like you'd see a food moving through a snake. That's the motility of that system, but you always want it to be able to come back to its original elasticity. All of that is because it's got sulfur and that ability of those sulfur, bond, um, sulfur bonds to stretch and recoil. So that's like creating the elasticity in our body. If you look at um, the skin, the skin actually has a similar amount of sulfur in it than the intestines do, maybe a little bit more because it's a little bit more rigid. And it also has uh, keratin, which makes the skin a little more waterproof. So there's a really big differences between the skin on the inside, which is the intestine, and the skin on the outside of our bodies. They come from the same progenitor cells. So in development, the group of cells that form both of these are the exact same source. So there's similarities and then differences between these. And the last point I want to make about this as a kind of aside is that the digestive system is your largest interface with the outside world, not your skin. You would think it's your skin. The surface area of the intestinal system is actually larger than the skin. And in that place, you're taking things from the outside that are foreign to your body and bringing them into the inside and introducing them. And that's why we have to have a strong protective barrier. We can't have leaky gut or else we're gonna get things entering our bodies that shouldn't and causing problems and inflammation. The hair has more sulfur than the skin and the intestinal system because it needs to be more rigid 
and it needs to be stronger and less flexible. And these bonds are um, strong enough to the degree where they found 9,000 year old hair still intact in mummified species. So these are like the, you know, the old form of, um, you know, preserving bodies. So 9,000 years um, old. And then if you're looking at something like perming your hair or straightening your hair, what you're really doing is you're putting the hair in the shape that you want it, using chemicals to break the glue, break those disulfide bonds, and then reform them to hold the shape that you want. And that's what a perm does. So it's working with those structural bonds. There's even more of the disulfide bonds, creating more rigidity in things like fingernails. And if you've ever smelled a rotten egg, you would smell sulfur. There's a lot of sulfur in eggs. And the reason for that is because you need that sulfur in order for um, that flexible and strong feather development, beak development, talon development. So there's a lot of sulfur that has to go into the development of something that actually has feathers on the outside of it. So I'm just going to summarize um, so it gets into more of a relatable thing in terms of supplements that you may have heard. So we start with sulfur, which is an element. Sulfur is what's used to, to form glycosaminoglycans, and we uh, abbreviate that as GAGs, glycosaminoglycans. Those are heparin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate, dermatin sulfate. So those are the GAGs. The GAGs form collagen, so sulfur, GAGs, collagen and collagen is what repairs leaky gut so you can take a collagen supplement but if sulfur is the rate limiting step then it makes more sense to flood your body with the sulfur so your body can make its own collagen and make its own connective tissue to repair the areas it needs so that's the principle that we're working with here um, so this is the end of the structural part of it let's look at the functional part of struct of sulfur Sulfur was the first antifungal that was used in farming. So sulfur has antifungal, meaning anti-yeast properties. Um, it is the main antifungal that's still used in organic farming. And there are even plants that produce sulfur on the top of their leaves defensively to protect them from fungal overgrowth in the wild. So antifungal, anti-yeast, that all means the same thing. Sulfur also has antimicrobial or antibiotic properties, and it has two of those. One of them is it can stop that bacteria by binding to its receptor sites so it can't bind to us. So that would be more of a bacteriostatic or stopping um, aspect of sulfur. Sulfur at high enough concentrations can be bactericidal. It can kill bacteria. And we would consider that an antibiotic, but I want to make a differentiation between sulfa drugs and sulfur. They're not the same thing. You can be allergic to sulfa drugs. You can't be allergic to sulfur. Sulfur is essential to life. You wouldn't be alive without it. It's throughout your system. You can take it. Um, there's There might be sensitivities, but um, that's sort of beyond what we're going to talk about. So sulfur is not the antibiotic. Sulfa drug is a combination. It's a compound that has sulfur in it. And it's because of the combination of that compound that allows to have an allergic reaction. It's not the sulfur by itself. It's the way it's put together. So again, not the same thing. Anyone who's concerned about having sulfur allergies and taking sulfur, you most certainly can because you probably need it. All right, where do we get it from? Sulfur is in the form of organosulfur. We get it from plants. So what happens is that we have, just like in the gut, we have a microbiome, we have a soil microbiome too, and that soil microbiome, just like the intestinal one communicating with us, the soil one is communicating with the plants. So in order to get sulfur into the sulfur-rich plants, like cruciferous vegetables, like brassicas, like the allium family vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds, what has to happen is the soil microbiome needs to oxidize the sulfur into a form where the plant can take it up and be rich in sulfur. So that's the only thing that has to happen, healthy soil microbiome, healthy sulfur in the plants. Um, the places where we have problems with that 
are with soil depletion of the healthy microbiome, refining our foods and processing our foods. So we lose sulfur along the way as those steps happen. But let's go back to soil depletion. Glyphosate. Glyphosate blocks the sulfur cycle in the microbiome of the soil. So what happens is that the microbiome, we've got some feedback there. You got it. Um, so what happens is that the microbiome of the soil, um, when it's exposed to these glyphosates, then the sulfur cycle is blocked. It can no longer convert into organosulfur. So the plants don't get that organosulfur in their production. So they're lower in that raw sulfur material that we need. Um, as a secondary effect also, um, the studies that have been done on glyphosate to tell us that it's safe for us, um, they sh you know, they've done studies and obviously it's on the market, it's Roundup, it's everywhere, right? Everyone has it in their body. People are born with the stuff in their body. It's everywhere. Um, but what it does is it doesn't necessarily affect our systems immediately. It really affects our microbiome by doing the same thing because it's designed to block some enzyme reactions in weeds so the weeds don't grow, but it's not exclusive to weeds. So it blocks microbiome reactions overall lowering of the organosulfur in the plants, in the animals that eat plants, and then us when we eat those plants and animals. There's a research scientist at MIT, her name is Dr. Stephanie Seneff. She's done years of research on organosulfur deficiency, on the link between glyphosate use and sulfur deficiency. If you do a search for her, you'll find uh, just a litany of research studies and papers um, and she believes that sulfur is the most common nutritional deficiency that we're not talking about, basically. So what did I do with that patient who had such a good re resolution of their long-term symptoms? Basically, I gave them this high sulfur uh, powder in a gradually increasing dose to a full therapeutic dose. And that's going to replace that deficiency, allow for repair of the um, leaky gut syndrome, allow for repair of the protective mucus, um, and help to rebalance the microbiome, eliminating those gas-producing species because it has antimicrobial and antifungal effects. I've added to that some uh, low fermentable plant-based fibers to start to give nutrition to the biome as we're going through the process. And there's also uh, marshmallow root, althea, and almus in there to help soothe and protect the GI system because most of the patients I'm working with that have these symptoms are very sensitive and we can't give them really strong treatments. We've got to nurture the system into a better place. Great, that was really helpful in explaining why this works so well. So what is the difference then for your diet approach and the typical SIBO diet? Well, what I do is I don't work so much with fermentable foods. So the theory behind that is a lot of people get put on FODMAP diet or SCD diet. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and those reduce the fermentable foods in the diet. The theory behind it is you're reducing the foods for the bacteria species you don't want um, to be overgrowing. But what I find is that for the most part, when those people reintroduce those foods, even after treatment, the symptoms come back. So I go a bit deeper in the, the layering of the problem and I look for the inflammatory foods. I mentioned earlier, those four inflammatory foods for the gut are going to be wheat, dairy, eggs, and sugar, right? So I'll either have the patient do an elimination of those and uh, elimination challenge to see what happens when they take them away and bring them back, um, or I'll do a food panel to see if those show up in the food panel. And then we'll remove those foods, the foods in that category, for the period of time that we're doing the healing and the repopulation um, of the small and the large intestine. So I really try and separate inflammatory foods versus fermentable foods. 
if someone comes in and they're on a FODMAP diet or an SCD diet and they like it, then I'm not going to stop them from doing that. It's their choice. Um, but I do prefer to make sure we haven't missed any inflammatory foods because if we have and we go through the treatment and they're still eating these foods, the system's still going to be weak. And so the overpopulation of SIBO can grow back easily in a weaker system. I'll also do more of a soft food diet. So I'll have people do foods that are low in whole grains, low in legumes, low in crucifers, just because at that point, they really can't digest those foods without getting symptoms. So I'll have them you know, doing root vegetables, really well-cooked foods, soft fruits, soft vegetables, um, um, grass-fed uh, animal protein, just as really simple stuff. Um, and then as they're, when they're better, I'll try and add those healthy foods back in slowly and just have the microbiome adjust to those. And it it's, works really well. Can you talk a little bit about the gas that people experience with SIBO? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important because I think we focus a lot on SIBO and we forget that both SIBO and SIFO can cause the same symptoms. And so if you're missing the fact that SIFO is there, which is a fungal overgrowth versus a bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth. So if you treat with an antibiotic because it looks like SIBO and people have tested positive for SIBO, but you miss the SIFO, then the same thing happens as when you take an antibiotic, say for a bladder infection, and you end up with a yeast infection. Antibiotics allow yeasts to overgrow. They just basically make a, a better environment for them to proliferate. Same thing within the gut. So that's really important. And there's actually um, a gastroenterologist, Dr. Sajish Rowe, um, who's done some samples. He's gone down with his endoscopy and taken liquid samples out of the small intestine and cultured it to see what is in that when he's encountered a patient that has these gas and bloating symptoms. And most of the time, it's a mixed problem. It's not just SIBO. It's SIBO and some kind of fungal overgrowth, primarily one of the various candida species that excuse me, that's causing the gas, gassiness. So again, you can't kill fungal species, you can't kill yeast species with an antibiotic. You can't do that. Um, for SIBO itself, you're dealing with three forms of SIBO that we're aware of, um, and that's always gonna be high up in the system. I'm gonna actually bring back that picture of the intestinal system when I talk about this. Okay, too far. Okay, so I don't know if I can do that. It's not working with me. But anyways, um, if we look at, I'll just describe it. So if we look at the intestinal system in the human, we're gonna see that the small intestine is centered in the middle, large intestine wraps around and is lower, right? So people that have lower abdominal bloating, that's not SIBO, that's SIFO, that's a fungal overgrowth. You can't really have SIBO in the large intestine because those two systems are so different. The small intestine is 25 feet of intestine in the center, all coiled up. And that system is uh, determined to break down our food and absorb our food nutrients. It's a very low bacterial system. The large intestine is where the liquid from all of that process ends up, and that system is to compact the waste and get it out. So nothing's being really absorbed or digested in there except for water and some electrolytes are going back and forth. But that's it. So all the digestion happens in the small intestine. You don't need fermentation. You don't need 
um, bacteria in there for digestion. There's a little bit just to kind of help the health of the system. But once you get into the large intestine, that's a fermentation area. We're actually supposed to have some gas in the large intestine. And if you eat something new that your body's not used to, having gas is, is pretty normal because the body has to deal with how do I break this down based on what species I have in there. But the large intestine, the last three feet of the system is loaded with trillions and trillions of bacteria. Two different systems, um, even though they're both called intestine, two different functions. Um, so with the SIBO and the small intestine, you're looking at things like the methanogens, producing methane gas, those are the archaea and the methanobacter species. You're looking at the hydrogen gas that we now know is produced by E. coli and Klebsiella, and that's through Mark Pimentel's studies that he's done. Um, and we also know that there is a hydrogen sulfide gas produced by the sulfate reductase bacteria that we can now test for in the panels. There's three gases we can test for in both well, actually, all three of us, myself, Dr. Seneff, who I mentioned earlier, who's the research scientist at MIT, and Dr. Nye, who does a lot of work on sulfur as well, we're all of the opinion that these sulfate-reducing bacteria overgrowth in the small intestine is actually an adaptation of the body to try and extract more sulfur from our food because we're starving for it because of the glyphosate use and the blockage of it in the plant growth. Um, and we actually also see it as what I would call an upstream problem, that when we clear out the hydrogen sulfide problem by providing the body with what it needs, then the other two problems go away. We no longer have a positive result for um, the hydrogen or the methane gas. And I've seen this with patients um, that I've tested and that have come to me from other clinics and I've put through this protocol um, that I talked about at the beginning. How interesting. Thank you for sharing that information. Could you also explain the symptoms of CIFO? Yes, yeah, so again, CIFO is going to be a small intestinal fungal overgrowth, um, and it usually is married to SIBO. You, they usually come together, and the, um, the symptoms are exactly the same. Painful gas and bloating that can pass a little bit, but is often trapped. And the people feel like, oh, if I could just release this, I'd feel so much better. Um, as an aside to that, I do have a lot of people that come to me who just complain of bloating, but it's not gassy bloating. So I want to just mm -hmm. caveat that that's a different thing, right? That's not a bacterial overgrowth. That's not a fungal overgrowth. That's some other inflammatory process happening there. So I don't treat those people the same way. It's got to be a gassy bloating to a gassy painful bloating or gassy bloating to use this protocol. So with CIFO, you're dealing with fungal species overgrowing in the um, small intestine. What's really important in that case, if you know that's happening, is to make sure that the patients have enough uh, adequate amounts of hydrochloric acid in their stomach when they're going through the digestive process. So as long as the stomach is strong enough and there's no gastritis or no breakdown of that protective mucus layer, you should be able to tolerate some kind of hydrochloric acid. And as the hydrochloric acid um, goes through and sterilizes the food that's coming in and activates it for um, digestion by the pancreatic enzymes, it gets dumped into the small intestine. And that little bit of acidity before it gets alkalinized in the small intestine is protective, right? So you're having less of the fungal species that you're taking in with your food able to populate as they go through the small intestine, and that's, that goes for bacteria as well. But I think it's really more, um, the HCL is really more of an antifungal at that junction between the stomach and the small intestine. Okay, thank you for that. We've got a little bit of time still. Could you give another example or case study of recovery with IBS and SIBO? Yeah, here's a good one. Um, I'm gonna read this from my book as well. Um, so this one is, there's a lot of testing that went through um, with these people. So it was a family of four that was actually referred to me by a colleague, Dr. Uh, Narala Jacoby, who does a lot of SIBO testing in Australia um, and work with that and was a classmate of mine. So what happened was this family of four came in and their diet was limited at that point to beef, 
fish, lettuce, greens, carrots, rice, citra, citrus and bananas. That was all that they were eating because they were so afraid to get their symptoms back because they had already been through when they came to me, three different doctors, three doses of Zyfactin um, as, a, as the antibiotic to take care of SIBO. And every time they tried to open their diet up again, all the symptoms would come back. So after the first one, um, they had done a wheat-free diet or gluten-free diet. And then um, after a few months, after the treatment of Zyfaxin, they put the wheat back in and their symptoms came back. So that's an example of that inflammatory impact of the wheat itself, um, weakening the system, allowing for the overgrowth to return. After the second course of Zyfaxin, um, they followed a specific carbohydrate diet, the SCD diet. And then after a few months later, they started to regress again when they started to reintroduce some of those SCD or non-SCD foods, um, carbs and fiber. So they went back to the prescriber and they were tested and yes, they were all positive for SIBO again. So what I did when I first saw them, we didn't change their diet, we just kept it where it was because they already had all of the you know, inflammatory foods out for the most part. They weren't eating any wheat, dairy, sugar, or whole eggs. So we just kept it. And I started all of them on the same protocol. They all had GI genome digest B, which contains the HCL, the pancreatic enzymes, and contains the uh, gallbladder support for breaking down your foods. And I started them on the GI1 powder, which is the sulfur powder we've just talked about. So when they came back after their initial starting dose, which is always gonna be about a half a teaspoon for two to four weeks, um, and we checked in and they had less gas, less bloating, less pain, less constipation, and diarrhea. They all had these symptoms. I mean, anything that was wrong with the digestive tract in addition to having painful glass and gas and bloating, these people had it. It was, it was a mess and they were really scared of their foods. So um, that was at the four week point. And then they was, were tolerating the treatment well by then. So I had them increase to the full therapeutic dose, which is six teaspoons a day, hold that for eight weeks. I saw them halfway through that and they all reported that they had begun to exper experiment with more foods. They added back legumes, wheat and dairy, and they were all tolerating that really well. By the end of the protocol, the end of the eight weeks of the full treatment dose, they were all eating gluten, they were eating sugar, although their mom really didn't want them to. <laughs> the boys were really happy about that, I'll tell you what. Um, and then I've been basically in touch with these people for the last 10 years. This is an older case and their symptoms have never returned. They've never had to have a more restrictive diet. So that's another example of just the power of replacing that deficiency using an antimicrobial and an antifungal together in a nutritive way rather than an antibiotic way to take care of a problem. Okay, wonderful. So something I just want to let you guys know that back in 2019, Dr. Janelle had published and released a book entitled Dr. Janelle, um, I'm sorry, hang on, let me find it here. Book, GI Janelle, Permanent IBS and SIBO Resolution. And it's available through our retail website, which is NutriNorthwest.com. It's also available through GIJanelle.com. And then just so that you guys are aware of, you can get the GI Janelle one, which is the powder that Dr. Janelle has been talking about at wholesale for our naturopathic clinics here. You can purchase it wholesale through Evolving Nutrition or retail through the Nutri Northwest website, which is NutriNorthwest.com. Or you can also purchase it through GI Janelle supplements, which is GI Janelle one or sorry, just gijanelle.com, which will then take you to our Nutri Northwest site as well. Um, Dr. Janelle also has got a couple of social media pages that you can follow. Her Instagram page or Facebook page are both available for you to follow and learn more about what she's doing. And that is going to be, her tagline will be GI Janelle. And then I wanna let you guys know that we have got a couple of promotions that'll be available. So after this, please feel free to reach out to us and we can share with you what those promos will be. Now I'd like to open up for question and answer section. If there's any questions that are anybody has or they would like to ask right now, now is the time to do it. 
you can either chat, mention it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Nope, I guess we don't have any questions, Dr. Janelle. All right, well, I guess I did a good job. You did. Thank you so much for all of that wonderful information. I didn't know about the sulfur. So that was very, very educational. We appreciate your time and you sharing your insight. Absolutely. My pleasure.